It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Temple Grandin to Sarah Lawrence College to deliver the 2010 Longfellow Lecture, The Way I See It, A Personal Look at Autism and Asperger's. And to welcome as well members of the Longfellow family and a diverse audience of students, faculty, staff, families, teachers, friends, trustees, and other colleagues, many of whose lives have been touched by autism in some way. The conversation about autism is an active one at Sarah Lawrence. Dr. Grandin's lecture is a highlight of a series of events organized by the Child Development Institute and the Health Science and Society Group that has included a talk on the epidemiology of autism, fact or artifact, understanding the increased prevalence of autism by Peter Bierman of Columbia University, and expertise, parenting and risk, autism and vaccine controversies by Trevor Pinch of Cornell. One more event will be held in this series, a panel discussion on treatment op options for autism. And in honor of the third annual United Nations World Autism Awareness Day on the evening of April 1st, 2010, Sarah Lawrence College participated, uh, participated in Light It Up Blue, sponsored by the organization Autism Speaks. Along with buildings around the world, Weston's was bathed in blue light to shine a bright light on the growing autism health crisis and the struggle of millions of families. You may not know that our relationship to Autism Speaks is a special one at Sarah Lawrence. The organization was co-founded by alumna and trustee emerita Suzanne Wright, 98, for whom SLC Suzanne Werner Wright Theater is named. A friend recently sent me a short article by Dr. Grandin's mother that was published in Miss Hall's school magazine called A Complicated Road. We're delighted the Temple Grandin's Road has brought her to Sarah Lawrence College this evening. I'd like to introduce Rachel Grob, who will introduce Temple Grandin. Good evening, everybody, and I want to add my welcome to Dr. Karen Lawrence's welcome and to greet each and every one of you as we begin the 2010 annual Longfellow Lecture here at Sarah Lawrence. It's fabulous to see this room so filled up, and we also send warm greetings and thanks to those of you who wanted to be in this room but simply couldn't fit and are instead joining us via the live web webcast. Several members of the Longfellow family are with us in person this afternoon, and we want as ever to extend our enormous thanks to you and your close friends for making this annual event possible. Today we honor, as we do every year, the memory of our alum, Cynthia Longfellow, who was herself so firmly dedicated to improving the lives of children. Autism may not have been as visible an issue during Cynthia's lifetime as it has since become, but surely her keen mind and her good heart would have led her to an impassioned interest in it were she still with us today. Finally, all of us at CDI want to give thanks to Ali Longo and Lauren Ricardi, Ricardi the passion you showed for autism-related work in general and for bringing Dr. Granda to campus in particular laid the groundwork for this event more than two years ago. These are two Sarah Lawrence students sitting next to Dr. Grandin down here. So hats off to you for your vision and for your persistence. <laughs> Dr. Grandin herself needs little introduction beyond what President Lawrence already said. After all, once a person is represented by Claire Danes in a highly successful film, <laughs> formal introductions seem to lack pizzazz. However, I do want to take a moment to remind you of just a few of Dr. Grandin's diverse accomplishments. She designs livestock handling facilities, She's a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. 
She's published hundreds of articles in the scientific literature, as well as numerous best-selling books, some of which will be available for sale here after the lecture, and I think were available beforehand, too. Perhaps most relevant, though, for those of us gathered here this afternoon, Dr. Grandin has created an unprecedented bridge between the world of people who live on the autism spectrum and the world of those who want, who need to understand what it means to dwell in that place. Millions have made an important crossing on this bridge and all of us who have done so owe a huge debt to Dr. Grandin for her hard work, the generosity with which she has always given her time, and the invaluable guidance she offers about how to address autism and the Asperger's syndrome. I had the privilege of eating dinner with Dr. Grandin last night, and while we were together, she spoke repeatedly about the importance of doing practical things and of learning about how things actually work. Please join me in giving the warmest possible welcome to Dr. Grandin, a person whose work Well, it's really great to be here today. Does this mic seem to be working all right? Okay, good. I think I'll just start out, talk a little bit about my background and about autism. When I was a little kid, uh, born in 1947, uh, nobody knew anything about autism. In fact, kids like me used to be just put away in institutions. Now, one of the things that really helped me was I got very good early educational intervention. When I was two and a half years old, uh, mother took me into the Boston Children's Hospital at Dr. Bronson Brothers. She was a neurologist. She referred my mother out to a little speech therapy school, and they did the kind of speech therapy. It's called ABA today. It was called speech therapy from you know old skilled teacher, you know back in 1950. And then when I was three, she hired a nanny who taught constant turn-taking games. I was allowed to have an hour after lunch where I could like go back into autism, but the rest of the time <laughs> I had to be kept tuned in. Now the thing is, autism is a very very big spectrum. You go on one end of the spectrum, you're going to have somebody who's going to remain nonverbal, may have epilepsy and other medical problems on top of autism. At the other end of the spectrum, you got somebody who's kind of geeky and nerdy and they're not very social, and they're running Silicon Valley. <laughs> uh, in fact, there's a book called uh, Asperger's and Self-Esteem, which is about famous scientists and musicians that probably had some degree of autism. See, there's a point where being kind of ne uh, not that social, it uh, becomes just a personality variant. You know, the, the genetics of autism is very, very complicated. It's not simple things like, uh, you know, blue eyes and blonde hair, you know, simple Mendelian kind of inheritance. It's a lot of little genetic changes, and it's pretty well embedded, I think, into the uh, development of the brain. You know, it's like a little bit of the trait. You might have a brilliant scientist or artist. Too much of the trait, and you've got a gigantic handicap. Um, but the... Uh, Early intervention, that's something that's really, 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 really key. And the other thing, being a child of the 50s, oh, I was taught to say please and thank you. I was taught to, um, uh, you know, uh, have table manners. You know, if I was like rotating my fork around up in the air, I wasn't allowed to do that. You know, sometimes there has to be some expectations for behavior. You know, one time I went out with a with an autistic 12-year-old and their, their family. And they went, he went to gas station and then they went to get gas. This boy proceeded to throw merchandise on the floor and really behaved badly in the store. Uh, <laughs> I didn't do that. I was taught, you know, you don't touch it until you're going to buy it. And, and, you know, being eccentric and different is OK, but you can't be a complete filthy, dirty slob. You know, it's just that simple. <laughs> And, you know, if mother hadn't always, like, pushed me to do things, I wouldn't have gotten anywhere. You know, when I was a little kid, all I wanted to do was do horse drawings all the time. Well, this is, why don't you do a beach? Why don't you do some other picture? You've got to broaden them out. Like, maybe all the child wants to do is draw pictures of trains, then teach reading with trains, teach math with trains. Use the motivation of that fixation to broaden it out. 
you know, to, to broaden out doing other things. You know, you don't want to stomp out the fixation because then you're going to destroy all the motivation. What you want to do is you want to um, use that motivation. That's the thing that you want to do. Now, to understand, you know, animal behavior, I do a lot of work in animal behavior, autism, sometimes art and mathematics, you got to get away from verbal language. You see, I don't think in verbal language. I think in pictures, kind of like Google for images. Well, an animal is going to think in pictures, in sounds, in touch sensations. There's a whole world where verbal language doesn't have anything to do with it. And if you're dealing with, dealing with a child that's on a more severe end of the spectrum, it's not going to be a verbal world. It's, you know, he's gonna, it's going to be a sensory-based world. You kind of got to get away from language to understand what's going on. And a child make, might make odd associations. Some kids are sound sensitive. So the school bell goes off and he's screaming and yelling. And, and uh, then if the child sees that little red fire alarm box in some other room, he won't want to go in that room. Because that little red box went off before. So whenever he sees one of those things, he's going to be afraid. There was one little boy that uh, was afraid of every time he saw a microphone. Because sometimes these things feed back and they make a terrible sound. And so he'd see a microphone and he'd be screaming. And then the parents might not be able to figure out why is he screaming. I can't emphasize enough the importance of really good teachers. Some teachers have the knack on working with these kids, and some teachers just don't have the knack. You know, too often times everybody's fighting over whether it's this method or that method. I think a lot of it gets down to really good teachers. And you gotta push some. Mother would push me to try new things. When I was 13, she had me doing a little sewing job. Now, because if you don't push a little bit, there's not gonna be any improvement. There's resistance to change, but you've got to do some pushing or, or they're just going to stay stuck in a rut. But the trick is just how much you push. You push too hard, the kid's going to be in a screaming fit. You don't push hard enough, uh, you've got real problems. And a lot of these kids have problems with sound sensitivity, touch sensitivity, visual sensitivity, and, and that can be a real problem. You know, my world is sensory based. And you know, the world of an animal is also sensory based. There really is a world. Some people think, and some philosophers think, that if you don't have language, you don't have thought. Well, I think it's absolute rubbish, because um, I think I am able to think. How could I possibly run a business, uh, drive to the airport, book an airline reservation, and a whole lot of other things, if I wasn't able to think? How could I design a piece of equipment if I couldn't think? You know, words narrate the pictures in my mind. I want you to get into thinking about other kinds of minds. Minds that oftentimes covered up with language. This is Van Gogh's Starry Night. Now, I don't think Van Gogh knew anything about statistical models of turbulence, but he managed to paint them into Starry Night. After some mathematicians got a hold of Starry Night, they looked at these patterns, and these were mathematical water turbulence patterns. You see, there's some evidence that language covers up the visual thinking, the pattern thinking, which is the mathematical thinking. I was just looking at a fascinating poster you had down in the science building on fractals and music. I gotta look that up. That looked very, very interesting because there's a lot of patterns and a lot of different things. There's also some evidence that language covers up things like art. Um, there's a type of Alzheimer's disease where, where uh, the frontal cortex is ruined, the language parts of the brain are ruined, and in a few patients, you'll see art like this come out. This uh, painting was published in the journal Neurology by Dr. Bruce Miller, and so the brain kind of gets wrecked from the top down, wrecked the frontal cortex first and the language parts, and that tears up everything eventually. Now the thing is, the autistic mind goes into the details. Okay, this is a kind of a test for kind of gestalt thinking versus detailed thinking. You got letters here, big letters, made out of little letters. Now if you take one of these and you flash it up on the screen and say, identify the big letters, a so-called normal person will identify the big letters quicker. The autistic person 
will identify the little letters more quickly. I've taken this test and I identified the little letters. Now I kind of like to look at the brain as this great big huge office tower. Because I've got to have a picture. You see, if I don't have a picture, I don't have thinking. So sometimes to think about more abstract things, I kind of have to make visual analogies. So at the top of this big office tower of Brain Incorporated, we've got the CEO and the president up there at the top. That's the frontal cortex. In fact, in brain science research, what the frontal cortex done, does is called executive function. Then below that, you've got the division vice presidents. You know, then underneath that, you've got the good geek stuff. Art, math, uh, all the fun stuff, music, things like that. A little lower down the building, we've got the emotion center there to stir up things, stir up trouble sometimes. And then you can also have a lot of problems on the incoming data lines. Some um, adults and children with autism have uh, t said that their hearing was like a bad mobile phone, cutting in and out. Another problem I had when I was little is I did not hear hard consonant sounds clearly. So my speech teacher would hold up a cup and she'd go, cup, pa. Because you see, the hard consonant sounds are really quick. Cat, ta. And if a child that remains nonverbal, if I said, the dog walked down the street, he might be hearing the all, 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 eat. He may not even be hearing the hard consonant sounds. See, the problem is, is the brain processes information more slowly. There's also problems with attention shifting. Like someone, like one time I was doing a talk and somebody was fanning themselves with a piece of paper right in the front row and it was driving me crazy because that rapid motion right in the front row tracks my attention and then it takes me a much longer time to shift away from that. Tension shifting slows. It takes much longer, like after the cell phone rings over here, and I did turn mine off, uh, rings over here, I look over there, and it takes me much longer to shift my attention back. Brains with problems, not just autism, process slowly. Attention shifting between two different things is slow. It just doesn't work quite as fast. Now some other interesting research has shown that the normal brain tends to ignore details. Well, there are certain things where details are really, really, really important. And uh, like if you're building a bridge and you forget about some details, maybe a <laughs> bridge is going to fall down. And mother, when she gives her talk, she says, I want my air traffic controller to be a little bit obsessive compulsive so that um, uh, my plane doesn't ram into somebody else's plane. And in working with animals, I say to people, we've got to attend to the details. You know, where are the ears pointing? Where are the eyes looking at? And Dr. Nancy Minshew at the University of Pittsburgh did a very fascinating study um, where she took normal people, people with Asperger's, which is the mild autism, and uh, normal and autism, you know, like three different levels here, put them in the scanner, had them read out of a book. The autistic mind, the brain is turned on for the detail of the words. The Asperger, which is a very mild autism, you get the detail of the words and the syntax. And then the normal person dropped out the detail of the words. There's a tendency to over abstract. I'm very concerned today on policy making that people are getting too far away from problem solving with practical things. And, and uh, then, then the brain over generalizes because that's a tendency that the brain has. Now, in my work with animals, I was very tuned into what they see. Okay, now this is the entrance going into a veterinary facility at a feedlot, and the cattle wouldn't go in there. The feed yard was ready to spend 100. Oh, we got somebody sleeping in my talk? You know, not allow that. Not in the front row. If you want to sleep, you can sleep in the back row. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I have fallen asleep during conferences, but I usually do it in the back row. And then I was at this other really, really important conference, and this guy had this Blackberry right in the front row. And I asked him to read all the interesting emails to the, everybody. And uh, it turned out he was like the Secretary of Agriculture or something of that state. I didn't know, I didn't know who he was. I only got after him for the uh, checking his email in the front row. If you're going to do that, do it in the back row. I won't bother you in the back row. <laughs> and 
You know what the problem is? You know why the cattle wouldn't go in the snowing? Because a flag was waving. You've got rapid movement and you have high contrast. All you got to do is move the flag. Not tear up the whole facility, move the flag. You know, sometimes the simplest, most obvious thing is not what people see. Look at how that animal coming out of that chute is looking at that sunbeam. It's looking right at it. Well, now if you have a cloudy day, you won't have a sunbeam there. But on a sunny day, they're likely to balk at that. When I first started noticing these things back in the 70s, when I first started, this was radical stuff. It was real, real, real radical stuff to be looking at what cattle see. Oh, cattle are stupid. Uh, but I noticed that cattle would balk at shadows. They'd balk at a little chain hanging down. I'd get inside the chute and see, what are those animals actually seeing? Look at all the shadows you've got there. They can see people through the side of the chute moving around. You know, if they're in a facility they haven't been in before, it's going to make them stop. Now, if you've got some dairy cow that walks into the same facility every day to be milked, we'll see the north shadow. But to the new animal, these shadows and these distractions are scary to them. And, uh, you know, it seems real obvious now, but it wasn't obvious 30 years ago. You know, sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. I have another slide that I often show that has a little chain hanging down in the chute. And, you know, the chain's hanging down in there, the animals won't go in. And I still have to talk about that to people because they don't take it out. I now have to make checklists. I'm getting better at communicating with the word things. I've got these whole checklists of, of, of things. <laughs> and look at how the horse and the zebra have an ear on each other. And then the other ear's on me. You're grazing animals, the ears work independently. Now, since I work with slaughter plants, I'm always getting asked if cows know they're going to get slaughtered. I had to answer that question early in my career. So I went over to the local swift plant, and then I went down to the um, feed yard to watch them go in the veterinary chute. They behaved the same way in both places. If I got rid of the distractions, then they'd go into both of them really well. Now, literally, I see movies in my mind. This is a picture that a young autistic boy drew in this little book called Little Rain Man. And He's showing pictures in his mind, like Google for images. See, everything I think about, I have a picture. Even something abstract, I have to have a picture. No picture, no thought. Even if I'm thinking about a smell, I see a picture of the, of the thing that would make the smell first, then I get the smell. Even abstract things are visual. You know, no, if I don't, you know, and then what I gotta do is I gotta put pictures into categories to form concepts. That's how I think. Now, I realized my thinking was different in the mid-90s when I wrote uh, Thinking in Pictures. You know, I think in pictures. I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't realize my thinking was different. Okay, now I'm understanding why the artists are fighting with the accountants. What I'm learning is <laughs> they really do think in a different way. And I was shocked. I asked people, think about a church steeple. And I was shocked to find out that most people got this generic, vague church steeple. I just start telling you where they're at. One I went to as a child, uh, one down the road, the one over on Drake Street, the one here, the weird round one, uh, the stainless steel cross one. You see, they come up like a series of images. My concept of what a steeple is, is based on a bunch of pictures put in a steeple folder. You know, if I only saw the classic New England steeple, I'd think, well, that's the only kind of steeple. Now, before I've been asking people, think about house or dog. Well, you're so familiar with your own home or your own dog, most people can visualize that. But when I ask you something, you don't own that, but it's out there in the environment. You have to see it, but most people don't pay much attention to it. Then you start getting these vague images. And what's happening in the brain, this, this vague image comes out of the association cortex. Well, what I'm doing is going deep down in the primary visual cortex, deep into where the primary sensory files are stored. I only see specific ones, and they flash up into my mind. Childhood one, local ones in Fort Collins, famous ones. And they come up into my mind just like it was shown in the movie. You know, they don't, they don't come up like Google for images like, a, like laid out on the screen. It's they, they, their sequential, how they come up. And the movie did a great job of showing how my mind works. And incidentally, it is on DVD right now. <laughs> and, uh, 
Blockbuster's gone bankrupt, so you, well, I know one place you can get it from Amazon.com. <laughs> okay, so much for the church students. Now, the thing is, thinking visually really helped me in my work designing facilities. Because when I designed something, I could see it in my mind. You might wonder why I have a curved uh, cattle handling facility. Because as the cattle come on around the bend, they think they're going back to where they came from. Cattle have a natural behavior to go back to where they came from. Now when I design things, I can actually test run equipment in my mind. Now I found that most designers that are good visual thinkers, they can do the still picture in their mind, but not the full motion. Now the thing about visual thinking, it's a continuum. Let's say I'm here, and then I found this one speech therapist that didn't get any picture at all. Then I found a number of people where all they get is lying like that on a steeple question. Okay, the speech therapist just heard the bell is here, and she's not blind because she drives. I checked that. <laughs> and so you've got on one end where you have almost no visual thinking, the speech therapist, you know, and so a few other people I've talked to. And you've got people like me on this end, then the ones that get the stick figure steeple are kind of here. Most people are kind of in the middle. They kind of get a, a vague one, but then I, then I make them hold the image and then they can start naming off specific. That's where most people are. And then you get a good, a lot of artists are right about here, they can do it, but they can't do a full motion. And there's an aerial view of the dipping vat facility that was used in the movie. One thing the geek side of me really liked is they duplicated all my projects absolutely exactly. <laughs> I actually did build that distorted room. This was a facility I designed originally at John Wayne's Red River Feed Yard in Arizona. And the squeeze machine was duplicated accurately. And I actually did build that gate. You could open up the car. And I built it when I was uh, 15 years old. And this brings up another thing. I was doing tasks that other people want. Yes, I got obsessed with cattle shoots. People didn't want to hear me talk about them. They wanted to hear me. They wanted me to design them for them. The kid has got to learn how to do tasks that other people want. And when I was 15 years old, I was taking care of nine horses. We're not doing enough on preparing kids for employment. They've got to learn, you've got to do something somebody else wants. You know, I, looked, I had some pictures of um, you know, this old detail house we had when I was in college, and I refixed up the outside of it, and I put tongue and groove paneling on it and white trim. No, did I decorate it with cows and horses? No. That's not what would have pleased other people. I made the scene when I was in high school for a play, trial by jury. Well, I couldn't decorate the courtroom with cows and horses. <laughs> I've got to make it something that they would want. You know, this is a very important skill to learn. You know, when kids get around middle school, we need to start thinking about what are they going to do when they grow up? And they've got to start learning work skills. One thing Mother taught me when I was like seven years old was to be on time. I'm seeing a lot of smart guys on the spectrum that can't be on time. I was given an alarm clock and expected to learn how to use it. And there's one of my drawings. And that's the actual drawing that was used in the movie. That is one of my real drawings that's actually from a job in the 90s. And that drawing sat on the conference table in the movie. Boy, the geek side of me just loved that. <laughs> and this brings up another thing. When I first started out, people thought it was really weird. And I remember going to this American Society for Agricultural Engineering meeting in the uh, early 70s, and nobody wanted to talk to me. And then I whipped out my drawings. In fact, I whipped out these drawings. They said, the, this drawing is from the late 70s, right here. And, you know, I show them, a, I show them a drawing like that. They go, ooh, you did those? You know, I, one thing I learned that I had to do is I had to sell my work, not myself. You know, the regular job interview process, forget it. <laughs> You've got to get a portfolio into the hands of the people that will approve like it. The art department, the engineering department, the math department, you know, the writing. Let's say your talent is writing. Well, you've got to get a sample of your writing into the right people. Freelance works often a good way to go because it avoids a whole ton of social problems. I can go into the plant, design a job, and then get out of there before I got 10 tons of trouble. <laughs> And even doing it freelance, I made a lot of social mistakes. Like telling the plant engineer he's stupid. <laughs> you know, one of the things I had to learn is, even if he's stupid, you don't tell him. 
another deal, another problem that I had to deal with was jealousy. I actually had, in a 35-year career, two plants where I actually had equipment badly damaged due to jealousy. And it, was da and it was damaged by management employees in the plant, causing thousands of dollars worth of downtime. Sticking a meat hook in a conveyor, that was one of them. The other one was passive aggressive, engineering passive aggressive. You don't grease the bearings on the conveyor so it will break. So that was the passive aggressive one. Well, that caused a pile of downtime. And it was hard for me, I was sort of like really naive, thinking, well, you know, that somebody that worked for Swift or for some other company would always have the company's best interest at heart. Uh -uh. I had to learn the hard way, you know, human beings can be nasty. I used to say design work and engineering stuff, that's easy stuff to do. Man, the people problems, that's the worst part of the project, is trying to deal with the people problems. Now, I have a class where I, my students do design, and they got to design a cattle handling facility. And I've noticed some very interesting things about perception over the years. You know, I started out, everything was hand drawing. You know, then in the, in the early 90s, everything switched over to uh, computers. And you take the older grafting people, they switched to computers, they did just fine. But today I'm seeing a lot of young kids. Oh, I see somebody nodding over there. Are you teach, ar you teach architecture? No, but I am a designer and I You're a designer? Transition from Android to Android. And you are doing just fine. But you get some 23-year-old, he doesn't know where the center of the circle is. You take some 23-year-old, he's never drawn a circle, he's never drawn by hand, and he's never built anything. You see, that, hey, the mouse is not connected to the brain the same way that the hand is. See, how does baby learn how to see? He feels the ball and he puts it on his mouth. That's how he learns to see. That's how the brain learns to see. And I have my students look at this drawing, this is my basic curved cattle handling facility, and then I just take this and I switch this back and forth like this. Because what they've got to learn how to do is how to relate the lines on drawing to the actual thing. And in my lab, I have them walk around our experiment station with the drawings in their hands and, and so that it, when, in the actual real cattle facility. But I do this flicking back and forth for the slides first. Now I've got a lot of students now that prevent, they're going to become dog and cat veterinarians. They probably could care less about designing one of these things. And so for these students, I've kind of changed the emphasis. Think of this as a visual problem solving. There's certain rules of how to lay these out. And then I have like 60 students get drawings, I lay out the 20 best ones. And they can see that there's different ways you can lay it out that will work. Now, so, no, that, there's really bad stuff that doesn't work. I only lay out the ones that would work. To get an A, they have to design something that would actually work. B's are a good try, C's are like hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got to get them to see it. Because you see, in myself, when I first started designing things, I just built things. I did artwork. I had to learn how to design with the drawing. Now what I had to learn is how to make every line on a drawing relate to a real thing. And in thinking in pictures, I talk about how I kind of magically learned drafting. But there was a whole phase where I had to learn how to read drawings first. So I got this big drawing, this whole big swift plant. The whole entire site, every piece of equipment was on it, the parking lot, the water tower, everything. Well, a circle was a water tower. A little square in the drawing, a big concrete column. You see, at first, I didn't see that. So I, I spent two days walking around with this drawing until every line on that drawing I related to a real structure. Now when I look at that drawing, I can build the plant. You see, now I, can, I don't have to work in the shop anymore to design stuff. I can do it on the drawing. OK, here are some of the mistakes they made. They didn't have the center of the circle in the center of the circle. I've had, I've got students today that don't know what a compass is. I had one girl spot a Boy Scout compass to draw circles with. <laughs> it was all I could do to choke it back and not laugh. I just, like, I really felt sorry for her. Like, uh, you know, a pig stockyard with 25 foot long gates. How's a 25 foot long gate going to work? Also, gate swings. They don't use the compass function in the computer. Where's this gate actually swinging to? They'll put the gate in and then they'll make a little thing like that. And they don't actually swing the gates on the drawing to see if they, they'll work. And you know what? I've gotten these kind of crappy drawings from every single major meat company. And every single time, it's come from a young guy, never built anything with his hands, never drawn by hand. Every single time. 
I had one drawing where, where uh, he used a stair step ramp for cattle. You go a three and a half inch rise, 18 inch run. Well, the plant engineer wanted to get, reduce the forming costs and go with a six inch step. I'm going, wait a minute, they might stumble. Uh, that's a, that's a hundred thousand dollar mistake that doesn't work. So we had to get the drawing, you know, put back. Well, he just shoves it in the computer, but he forgets to go from the six inch step to the three and a half inch step, you have to have more steps. So I get the drawing back and it goes, and then like that. <sighs> oh, I'm really glad I looked at these drawings. Now, in young kids with autism, uh, if they're going to have art skills, it often shows up around nine years of age. You see kids drawing drawings in perspective. You know, most kids don't draw in, in perspective. Build on these talents. And lots of times these abilities don't show up in kindergarten. You're going to see this if you're going to see it third or fourth grade. It was third or fourth grade that made a beautiful clay horse. But it made it out of that yucky plasticine, so there was no way you know, could, we could keep that. It's build on these strengths. Kids that tend to be visual thinkers, they tend to do drawing. You know, these are kids that when they grow up, they can become, you know, artists, graphic designers, animators. Well, this is really a fun slide. This is a brain scan that was done at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm going in on October 8th to use the super duper machine that's like got the program for tracking uh, the myelinated white matter in the brain. I just got that scheduled this afternoon. <laughs> and, and what this is, this is tensor imaging. And what tensor imaging does is it, is it, it maps the white, big white, huge cables that are in the brain. See, in your brain, you got gray matter. And then the other part of your brain is white matter. Gray matter is your like, integrated circuits. White matter is the inter-office communication between different departments in the brain. Well, I've got a giant cable in there. That goes all the way back to primary visual cortex. Primary visual cortex in the back of the brain. And the controls cables are only twice as, you know, a minor twice as big as the controls. I used to joke around about having a giant graphics card in my brain. Turns out I do. Look at the big one there I got on the right hand side compared to my controls. That's a slice right up here at the eye level. Now the thing is, not everybody with autism has this. Because not everybody with autism is a visual thinker. See, one of the things that is a characteristic of autism is good at one thing, bad at something else. Now, some other research that they've done at the University of Pittsburgh has shown that people on the spectrum do tend to, to use visual thinking because you can have sentences that are really visual, uh, like you have to answer true false while you're in the scanner. Rocks are living things. That being an example of uh, something you could visualize, true, false. Uh, uh, arithmetic is a type of math. Okay, that's supposed to be one of the non-visual ones. Well, when I was reading a research paper, I see my third grade classroom. You know, even the one that was supposed to be non-visual, I, I saw visually. You see, one of the things in autism is, is, a, is you're missing a lot of inner office communication in the frontal cortex. But back here in the back part of the brain, you know, where the fun geek stuff is, you know, on the higher end of the spectrum, you may get more circuits. I think that explains savant skills, some of the art skills. Okay, let's talk a little bit about diagnosis. First of all, diagnosis is not precise. It's a behavioral profile. And with the DMS-5, they're going to be changing the behavioral profile, and, and, and PDD, NOS, and Asperger's will become just part of the autism spectrum, which from a scientific standpoint is correct. But it may cause a lot of problems with service providers. It's not precise. It's, I mean, nobody sits in a conference room and decides what the diagnosis for tuberculosis is going to be. No, well, tuberculosis, tuberculosis. You can do a definitive lab test. You know, then in some kids, there's a lot of mixing up between ADHD and, and Asperger's. That gets mixed up. In fact, the ADHD medications often work for the mild Asperger, because I think they are biologically similar. I can't wait until I can get into brain scanning. It's really, really high speed, and you could throw different stimuli in and figure out what's going on in the brain. Now, I'm a visual thinker. My thinking is photorealistic, photorealistic pictures. Think Google for pictures. There's another kind of mind on the autism spectrum. It's the pattern thinker. They think in patterns. Think more abstract visual thinking. Think origami. Think of chess. I wasn't very good at chess. Think um, 
organic chemistry molecules. Now this praying mass, this is extreme origami, is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. And what you see in the background there is the folding pattern. That's not my kind of mind. But one thing that seems to be the same in the autistic kind of mind is good at one thing, bad at something else. Uneven skills. That's kind of universal. This is a really important slide. And you know, in a lot of people, the kind of the quirky people, the nerdy people, some of the artistic people, where good at one thing, bad at something else. Photorealistic visual thinkers like me cannot do algebra. So how did I get through college math? Thank goodness they had the new math craze back in the mid-60s. And the math was finite math. That was probability, statistics, and matrices. Doable with tutoring. Uh, algebra would not be doable with tutoring. And I'm finding a number of students that can't do algebra, but they can do geometry and trick. And they need to be allowed to go to geometry and trick. But you see the verbal mind says algebra is a prerequisite for geometry and trick. But there's a certain kind of mind where that's not so. And when I talk about this at conventions, I have people coming up to me after and say, oh, I was one of those. And then you have the pattern thinkers. These are your programmers, your engineers, your musicians, your math minds. Think patterns. Oh, there's underlying patterns. You know, and I looked at that thing on fractals and music. You know, you look at, you know, geometric patterns in plants. You know, patterns that just sort of have formed in nature. You know, maybe the brain works on patterns. Uh, who knows? And then there's another verbal kind of Asperger's where they know every fact about history. That's often their favorite subject. They do not draw. They are not a visual thinker, and, they're, and, they're, and their math skills are just average. And then you have people where, they, where the, eye, the visual system's all messed up. Where back here in the visual cortex, there's problems with the shape, color, and motion circuits. And they go to read the prints jiggling, and they are often auditory thinkers, where hearing is their best sense. They learn through the auditory sense. Now let's start thinking about jobs for some of these kind of thinkers. Well, the people like me, industrial design. What I do with cattle equipment is in, called industrial design. You know, you take a product, you know, like an iPad or something like that, the industrial designer designs, okay, what is this thing going to look like? How, how the little icon's going to move? What's the user experience with this device? And the engineers have to make the innards work. Now, hopefully, the engineers are, are um, working well with the industrial designers. A little problem with that on the latest iPhone. You know, it's very, very, very pretty, but you put your hand on the antenna, and over here at the Consumers Union, they put duct tape on it, so your hand wouldn't be right against the antenna. Okay, a little conflict there between the industrial designer and the, and the engineers. You know, other devices, that they were working, you know, better together. Architecture would be another good field. Graphic design, computer animation, uh, photography, art, fine art. So it would be another area for the people that are the visual thinkers. And you can have visual thinkers that are not autistic. The pattern thinkers, those are your engineers, your programmers. That's half the people in Silicon Valley. If you got rid of all autistic genetics, you get rid of the future generation of Silicon Valley. <laughs> they got a little bit of that trait, and you get the uh, you know smart geek. He's not very social. You know, is autism really increased? The mild end? I don't think so. Geeks and nerds now have a medical label. And then you have the verbal mind. Um, some of these guys would be uh, good technical writing journalism, tour guides. It'd be a number of different things they'd be good at doing. Auditory thinkers are going to be good at doing auditory things. You know, if people are not just stuck in some awful entry-level job, they often tend to gravitate eventually into careers that kind of match in with their way of thinking. You know, that's one of the reasons why I ended up, you know, staying in the design business because I'm good at, uh, you know, doing design. So how do you form a concept? I have all this specific information. Well, this is a picture that the same little boy sent to me showing how he's sorting cats and dogs into boxes. So my church steeple concept is based on a bunch of steeple pictures put in the steeple file. Then you might have cell phone patterns. Okay, they go on another box. I'm seeing the stupid trees and other you know, ridiculous ways to try to camouflage and look really fake. And then I'm visualizing a church steeple that inside it has cell phone transmitters. Because I read an article that the churches were running out their wood steeples. They've got to be wood ones, otherwise it won't work, to the cell phone companies. 
you know, radio towers, that would be another, another um, you know, category. I'm seeing the uh, first one that comes up in my mind, WBZ in Boston. I remember driving by that on you know, my way in to see my grandmother's. So I see this big TV tower. But you're taking the details and sorting them into categories. The other thing that's really important is autistic thinking is bottom-up thinking. You take the details, you piece them together like a puzzle to get the answer. Where the normal mind is top down. So you want to teach them stuff, you got to teach with specific examples. Like in the dog's brain, on the leash and off the leash, that's two different things. When I'm on the leash, I protect my owner. When I'm off the leash, I can go to play. Cattle will perceive a man on a horse and a man on the ground as two totally different things. Horse does the same thing. A horse has been abused by a rider. Be bucking and rearing when you ride him. He'll be perfectly good for the veterinarian for shoeing. Or if he's been abused by the shoer, then he's going to throw a fit when you try to work with him on the ground. But be fine for riding. And what motivates that? Fear. And what is one of the main emotions in autism? It's fear. Research is very clear. The fear system in the brain, it's working overtime. And the movie showed very nicely how I acted in the 60s and the 70s before I took antidepressant medication. Now, I've been on antidepressants for 30 years. I don't dare stop taking them. A really low dose. Anxiety, the thing that's often really works well for anxiety is a little tiny dab of Prozac. Often works wonders. I know lots of designers are taking Prozac. And what it does is it stops the anxiety. But the mistake that's made is when you're using Zoloft or Prozac for anxiety, you need a much lower dose than for treating depression. If you take too high a dose, you'll get anxiety, agitation, and insomnia. You'll feel like you drank 25 cups of coffee. And un unfortunately, sometimes doctors are raising the dose when they ought to be lowering it. And I, you know, Prozac is the original SSRI. It's still one of the best. I've been getting complaints on Paxil on memory problems. So that doesn't any drug that like messes up your mind. I'm not a big fan of. I'm I'm kind of horrified all the medications given out to little kids like candy. I I know a number of little kids where they've tried some of the special diets, dairy free, wheat free, and sometimes that works. It doesn't work on everybody. This is one of the problems in autism. It is so variable. Something that works for one doesn't work for another. It's bottom-up thinking instead of top-down. You've got to put the pieces together. This is a very, very important concept for anybody that's working with either animals or, you know, little kids with autism. You've got to learn specific concepts by putting many different specific examples in different file folders in the mind. And research shows that the, the brains make file folders, but most of this is hidden. There was an interesting experiment done with primates where um, they had a dog picture gradually change into a cat picture. They were taking recordings off the brain and there's a point where it switches from a dog to a cat. And a category, the category has well-defined boundaries in the brain. The brain's set up to make categories. There's been work in stroke patients where the person had a stroke and now he can, um, he can categorize tools and animals and plants, but he can't... Um, I uh, categorize uh, vegetables because the stroke went in and wiped out the vegetable file. Now, you're not born with a vegetable file, but you eventually, you know, make one. And if a stroke gets in the vegetable file, you're going to have trouble categorizing vegetables. To teach concepts with specific examples, let's say we want to teach the concept of up. The kite's up in the air, you walk up the stairs, you walk up the hill, you go up in the attic, you lift up a cup. These are all examples of up. Because if you only use the up in, in going up the stairs, then a child's going to think it only applies to going up the stairs. Teach math concepts. They got to learn that math applies to many different things. Toy dinosaurs, bottle caps, coffee cups, pencils, uh, pens, uh, you know, Disney stickers. You know, it applies to many different kinds of objects. Maybe you use like 10 different kinds of objects. Then they'll start to get the concept. You gotta start teaching things like less and more in fractions. Okay, if I have a glass of two glasses of water, one glass of water may have more water than the other glass of water. That's teaching the concepts of less and more with different specific examples. Cut up a piece of fruit to teach fractions. Cut up a pizza to teach fractions. 
you know, use some different kinds of things. Then they'll really start to get the concept of math. Now this horse is definitely afraid of black cowboy hats. You know, this is associative thinking. Because when somebody abused him, he was looking right at a black hat. Now if you put the hat on the ground, it's less scary. Because you see, when it was on the ground, it was a different picture. But as that black hat got brought up closer and closer and closer to my head, it got scarier and scarier. White hat's fine. See, it's very specific. Very, very, very specific. Um, one of the problems that a lot of people with autism have is, is uh, they've got to have a lot of very specific directions. Oftentimes, written instructions will work better. I can't follow more than three written instructions. Um, I also absolutely cannot multitask. That's another thing. Well, you know, some things aren't in multitasking. I can do something like put the laundry in and then for half an hour go do something else. I can do that. But trying to do two things at once, like if I had to be a receptionist in a busy office and I had to type and answer the phone constantly, that would not work. <laughs> now, I think the thing I think is really important is we've got to figure out how to get the different minds to work together. We need the different kinds of minds. I'm getting very concerned. I'm seeing smart, geeky kids that ought to be going to Silicon Valley uh, uh, not going there. And if those kind of smart kids that are out in California, the, the engineering companies, the computer companies, they snap them right up. And then I go to Missouri and I talk to some teachers there and they're, you know, they graduate from high school and sit in the basement and play video games. And we can't, you know, I was allowed to stim for an hour after lunch and do a 1950s video game spinning a little brass thing on the bed round and round and round and round. I would have missed video game addict. Those things have been around. And then I wouldn't have been out Googling things. And you don't get rid of video games, but you've got to limit it. Now there's going to be some kids, they can learn how to program that game, but not me. I'm not programming material. Also, I don't do the right kind of artwork that you would need for, uh, for video games. I would just you know, get addicted to them. We want to look, think about different kinds of minds. I want you to think about different kinds of thinking. You know, there's been a lot of talk about brain plasticity. Yes, you can change some. Okay, let's go back to the visual continuum I've got here. I can take somebody that's here in the middle and make them a bit more specific or make them a bit more abstract. I can't take the speech therapist here and get her to here. That's not going to happen. Maybe I could get her to see a dim church steeple. <laughs> you know, you got to kind of look at, you're born with certain stuff, and then you can, you've got a certain amount of plasticity. But I can't take an auditory speech therapist and make her, make her uh, doing all kinds of visual design work. Uh, that just won't happen. Why is she a speech therapist? Because then she's using her hearing. That's why she picked that career. And she had no visual thinking. I had dinner at her house. And I said, can you visualize going into your office over at the university and uh, going in and opening your office door, entering your office, and sitting down at your desk? She could not do that. Most people can do that. I want to help these different students with unique minds to be successful. One thing I always tell uh, uh, teachers, develop the students' strengths. Too often in special ed, we got way too much emphasis on the deficits and not enough emphasis on building up the area of strength. <laughs> and we've got to think about how can we build up the area of strength into something that's going to make the person a contributing you know, member of society. And one of the things that really helped me was my mentor science teacher. He was shown beautifully in the movie. And uh, my dad had my science teacher when I was in high school. I had no motivation to study. I was getting all these good work skills, taking care of horses and building things. But I wasn't interested in studying until I had the motivation of becoming a scientist. You know, reading about um, education in this country, we seem to do pretty good with it, little kids. High school's just a mess. And one of the things we need to have in high school is teachers to get kids turned on. Well, there's a lot of people, you know, maybe they've retired from working in chemistry or biology or history or English, you know, journalism or something, and they'd like to teach a class. They can't do it in high school. They can do it at the community college. They got the degree, got a master's degree, they can teach it at the community college. We need to be doing something so you could take a retired chemist and he could maybe come into the high school and teach chemistry and have some mentoring program at the school so you're not just throwing them in there with the kids. I mean, I'm getting older now. So I get to where I can't travel. 
you know, I'd love to teach a you know neuroscience class in high in a high school. I'd be totally qualified. I got a PhD and all, all my thesis work was on neuroscience things. Take three years of ed courses, no way. You know, there's a research out there, and I'm thinking, I'm particularly thinking about, you know, in high school, the specialty subjects. You know, you'd have, you know, what would be the ideal mentor teacher, uh, a, you know, for let's say a retired chemist. Well, you know, if he's going to teach chemistry, I want the degree in chemistry, but I'd like to have some industry experience where his job, at least a good portion of his career, has something to do with chemistry. Because we've got to get kids turned on to what they can do. One thing I'm getting very concerned about right now in this country is we've gotten away from doing things, making things, and practical things. People get interested in the environment or some other issue. Well, they just want to sue everything. Well, we're going to need more people to figure out how we're actually going to fix things. OK, you have this lawsuit. Well, then, then what do you do? Then you've got gridlock. You've got to have people that figure out how to get the oil out of the out of the ocean that's now stratified in the muck mess down at the bottom of the ocean because they put all those dispersants in there. How do, you, how do you fix that? That's a real mess. We need people to figure out you know, new ways to get energy and things like that. And I went over to China about three years ago. Oh, man, eye-opener. Boy, are they industrious. Super work hard, super industrious. I think it's a big shame that schools have taken out so many of the hands-on classes. Art classes, sewing classes, welding classes, shop classes, music, uh, drawing and drafting. Now, a lot of these things have moved over to the community college. I know smart Asperger kids on the autism spectrum that drop out of high school and they find their mentor over at the local community college. But we've got, we've got to start working on how can we mentor these kids because they're ending up as criminals or they're ending up on the welfare rolls and wasting, you know, really, really talented people. And sometimes it's the shop teacher or the art teacher. You know, when I was a little kid, if I hadn't had art and sewing when I was in elementary school, I mean, I would have just been dead. You know, in the 50s, girls learned embroidery, loved embroidery. Then uh, my friend Eleanor and I petitioned to be the first girls to take wood shop. <laughs> Hated cooking class. You know, then you can use hands-on classes to teach math concepts. Okay, let's say in a cooking class you could have much more emphasis on, on uh, the measuring. Okay, you know, certain liquids when you mix them together when you cook turn into emulsions. Well, that's chemistry. You know, you can kind of integrate the things together. We've got to give those different kinds of minds an opportunity. This is the slide I originally used at the TED conference. I said we've got to hire them and mentor them. But I'm really concerned about a lot of these smart kids that are going down the wrong road. As soon as you get out away from tech centers and from big intellectual centers. You know, when everybody was out on the farm, a lot of these kids were brilliant, you know, working on the farm. And then I think about, you know, back in the medieval times, you know, the person that makes the arm, builds the cathedrals. You know, maybe he's really weird, but boy, he's really good at making stained glass windows. <laughs> See, he was appreciated for what he did. Art class, boy, it was my salvation. Horses and these kinds of things, if I hadn't had these things, I, I just wouldn't have uh, gone anywhere. These are the things that made life worth living for me. Now, another thing that can happen with a lot of autism and a lot of other disorders is sensory processing problems. I am finding in my class, I get about two students every semester that have a real mess up with their visual system. And when they go to read the print jiggles, and when they try to draw my cattle handling system, okay, I ask them to draw a line and go three half circles like this, they're drawing. Well, they're not seeing it. And the problem is back in here. There's something wrong with the circuits in the brain that process shape, color, and motion. I had a dyslexic student that had this problem. She absolutely couldn't tolerate fluorescent lights. You can see the 60 cycle flicker. And sensory processing disorders are really debilitating. And they are comorbid, I hate that term. That means, you know, happen in conjunction with a lot of other disorders. And we need to be doing a lot more research on, on how to treat and understand these sensory problems. They're also very variable. When I was a little kid and the school bell went off, it was like a dentist drill hitting a nerve. My visual system's fine. Another kid can't stand smells. I still can't stand scratchy clothes against my skin. And I'm finding that there's differences. You can take 10 100% cotton t-shirts. Now wash them, and some itch, and some don't. This has to do with the type of cotton and the weave. 
And that's like sandpaper in your underpants. <laughs> you know, they've done umpty um zillion papers on the fact that people on the spectrum are terrible with face recognition. I had a little embarrassment with that this morning, remembering faces. We aren't doing anything with these sensory issues. How can you be social if you can't tolerate a noisy restaurant? You can't tolerate going to a football game. You can't tolerate an office environment. I know people where the sensory problems are so bad, they're living in a dark house. And then you read on some of the Asperger forums on the web, they say, don't call me mild autism, I'm like totally handicapped. This is a person where the sensory problems are so bad, they're in a darkened basement. Yeah, that's extremely, extremely debilitating. And for every hundred papers we've got on the social stuff, we have one paper on sensory. I just uh, talked today, I uh, talked with a funding foundation. And they asked me, what's the most important thing to do research on? Right now is this sensory stuff. How do we treat it? Uh, one thing that sometimes works for sound sensitivity is you take the dreaded fire alarm, and usually the high pitched sounds are the worst, put it on a recording device, but it's got to be a full spectrum recording device, and then you let the person initiate the really bad sound. Sounds that the person initiates himself a better tolerant. Then gradually turn it on louder and louder and louder and louder, but they're controlling it. Another thing that works, and there's only a couple, there's one case study in the pub, on the PubMed database under hyperacusis. If you type in hyperacusis, that means sound sensitivity and fancy talk. Uh, you type that in, there's a paper where a little tiny dose of risperidol. Now, risperidol is a very powerful drug. You take too much of it, you're going to get fat and get diabetes and you're going to get the shakes. But a teeny, weeny, weeny dose, a quarter of a milligram a day, a dose so small the doctor says it's not going to work, can sometimes fix sound sensitivity in teenagers and adults. It also works for extreme aggression problems. I can't not emphasize enough the amount of drugs being given out like candy. I think it's just shocking. People are not thinking about how they're using the drugs. You want to try one thing at a time and see if it works. Don't do a new school at the same time you do a drug, otherwise you don't know what works. And in my book, Thinking in Pictures, I've got a whole section in there on medication and logical thinking. I'm also very sick and tired of the fight between alternative and regular medicine. That is just ridiculous. In my own health situations, I'm using some of each. Careful use of some of each. So find out the things that work, and then that's what you do. Now, well, there's a picture of a little boy covering up his ears. Yeah, that school, that was bad, real bad. And you might have one kid loves running water or play with running water, another kid hates running water. The problem with the sensory issues is they're so variable. They vary from a minor nuisance to totally debilitating and everything in between. My problems are mainly touch sensitivity, scratchy clothes, couldn't tolerate being hugged. Now you can see if you watch the Emmy show, we did some hugging there. <laughs> and and uh, my visual system's fine. Another person cannot tolerate fluorescent lights. They can see the flicker on fluorescent lights. Tension shifting. I already talked some about the problems with tension shifting. Now, people that have this weird visual problem, you see how the print looks like it's jiggling on the page? Out of 60 students in my design class, I find two of these every semester. And I can tell by the messed up way they do the drawings. There's a certain kind of messed up drawing they do. Okay, like if they just look at the basic cattle sheet, you know, I got two little lines going around like that. My dyslexic student couldn't draw that. And I said, what are you seeing? I don't understand what's wrong with you. She says, I see waves between the lines. And then she got an Erlen lenses, which are simply pale colored glasses. You try on you know, pink and purple and all these different colors, all the hippie glasses, the real pale ones, until you find the right color where the print no longer jiggles. That color is different for everybody. Why does that work? I don't know. But I, I talked to one mom where her child could tolerate five minutes at the local Walmart before he went into sensory overload. Felt like he was inside the light show and inside the speaker at the rock concert. She got some pink Disneyland glasses and could do an hour of Walmart. I had students come back after they went sunglass shopping and so oh, I got an A on the economics quiz because now for the first time, 
The PowerPoint slides that they show, all the graphs and things are not jiggling. I can actually read them. I can actually see them. Sometimes pastel paper works. Laptop computer. My, my dyslexic student would flunk out of school without a laptop. You know, let's say you're stuck in a room with fluorescent lights. No windows. Get a 100 watt lamp, put it next to the desk. Old fashioned hot lamp. Old fashioned energy waster lamp. Because those twirly things you screw in, some of those are just as bad. There are some of my books. What I want to do right now is uh, just open it up for questions. I don't have any idea how long I've talked. Because I don't have any clock. How long have I talked? 26. 26. That's going to be just about right. We've got about 15 minutes or so for questions. And if nobody has any questions, I'm going to pick somebody. Because I find lots of times I've got to kind of break the ice. <laughs> Okay, and I'll repeat the question back. We'll right here, this question. Okay. Um, the way you describe working um, with uh, children and giving them specific examples of up. Yes. Didn't seem any different from what an intelligent early childhood person does with neurotypical or whatever. Well, but the problem is, the question was a good early childhood teacher would do this, but they're not doing it. I find that I'm presenting this concept at conferences, at autism conferences, and it's like a completely brand new concept. That's like a revelation to, to some people. You know, Miss Reynolds, my speech teacher, she, she did what they call ABA now, is what Miss Reynolds did with me. And she kind of knew how hard to push. You've got to push hard enough to get advancement, but you don't push so hard to get sensory overload. Some kids are monochannel. You can't see and hear at the same time. They can either look at something or they can hear something, but they can't do both. And you've got to be more gentle with them. You've got to have a quieter place, but you still got to push a little bit. You know, there's an art to teaching. I had a, gave a talk at, at one, one of the educational colleges, and I had a very frank discussion before my talk. Uh, I said, how many, if you take 10 students, how many would be the natural good teachers? 20%. Then uh, how many can they train? Another 60 or so percent. There's a bottom 10 or 20 percent. This is kind of hopeless, especially with the little kids. And you know, it's the same thing with stockmanship. I have found with cattle handling, you teach someone how to handle cattle really quietly using behavioral principles, 20 percent stay good stock people. Another 60 percent I can train. I got to supervise them so they don't lapse back into rough methods. There's 10 percent. They shouldn't get anywhere near an animal. <laughs> okay, right here. When it comes to mainstreaming, I'm much more of a mainstreaming fan, especially the little kids. You know, I was mainstreamed in a normal school. It was a little country school. There was only 12 to 13 kids in the class, old-fashioned, 50 structured classroom. So we're very similar to a lot of rural schools. And that worked. 30 kids in a chaotic classroom with the kids doing all different things, that would not have worked. But I think it's very, very essential for uh, little autistic kids to get, you know, do activities with other normal kids. They don't always get asked about public versus private. So much depends upon the particular school and the particular teachers. As I travel around, I got one parent, oh, I think their public schools are just wonderful. The other parents, and their kids at a private school and they're fighting with the school. So many things depend upon the particular school and the particular teachers. Unless you're in a mess of a district where things are just, you know, totally completely overloaded, but I find I, I, you travel around, uh, certain parts of the country are better on services. Uh, the other thing that these little kids don't <coughs> wait. I go down south a lot, there's no services. They got a three-year-old sitting there stimming out, vegging out. I said, don't wait. Get some grannies, get some teachers, I mean, go to your church, get some volunteers, go to your synagogue, you know, whatever. Get some volunteers and work with these kids. Nothing's the worst thing you can do with an autistic two-year-old because there actually may be growing brain circuits that are bad because when they do all that stimming, what happens is, is uh, they, they're shutting out the world. And the reason why I did all the stimming was because when I did the stimming, then um, I could shut out the hurtful sounds. But the problem is if you let a kid stim all day, most brain's not going to develop. Okay, right here. Would you consider echolalic behavior very similar to, to stimming in general? Well, echolalic kids 
Lots, they, that, I'd be happy with the kids echo it because the, the speech circuits are working. What they've got to learn is that the words mean something. A lot of echo kids, and I've talked to people that were echo as a kid, that then now have normal speech, they think the tone of the voice is the language. They've got to start learning with hundreds of flashcards where the picture and the word on the same side of the card, that these words mean something. Like the child might come around and sing a McDonald's commercial at dinner time because he knows that that's related to food. So he's starting to understand that the words have meaning. Echolalia kids can learn how to talk. If you stomp out echolalia, it might stomp out speech. What you want to try to do is encourage using it in a, in a communicative manner. It sounds like for early intervention, say a two or three year old potentially nonverbal, you really espouse the idea. But I'm wondering how you feel about four. Okay, well, you know, when it comes to the ADA and the really uh, intensive stuff, yeah, two, three, and four year olds, a lot of intensive ABA, get language jump started, that's good. Now, you, now when the kids start to get really high functioning, ABA is way too rigid. Also, really good ABA is a lot less rigid. You know, the original ABA was very, very rigid. As I travel around, there's a lot of different variants of what they call ABA. You know, it, it, well, you know, what I find about floor time, ABA starts to look like floor time in the hands of a good teacher. ABA starts morphing into some floor time, floor time starts morphing into some ABA. And the good teachers do a combination of approaches because they don't pay any attention to the ideologues. <laughs> you see, being a bottom up thinker, I'm interested in outcomes. You know, parents are saying, well, now, should I go to a different school or something like that? I go, what kind of progress are you getting? One thing that's a problem all around the country is as many schools the kids get an hour of speech and an hour of OT and sensory stuff a week is not enough. So then what I suggest to the parents is that's definitely not enough, especially with a little kid, like a three or four year old. Got to get some students and some volunteers, get some other people, to work with that kid and have them go over to school and use that one hour speech a week to coach you for tons of other therapy the whole rest of the week. Because I definitely believe in professional guidance. But I'd say in about, oh, half the, half the places I go, it's an hour of speech, an hour of OT a week. That's all I get. You've, you little kids, you've got to do more. I know that you talk about 40 hours a week of one-to-one -one for especially early childhood young children. And that can include, the, out of the 40 hours of one-to-one -one can include mismanaged meals. Let's look at my, what was done with me. Three times a week I had the speech therapy in a little structured nursery school with six other kids. Two, two teachers ran it out of their house. Then I had the nanny. I was with her like for eight hours a day. And we'd sit at the table and do table manners. That's part of the 40 hours. Just as long as it's interactive. You've got to be interactive. I was allowed to have an hour after lunch where I could just veg out and spin the twirly thing on the bed. <laughs> but those mismanners meals were part of the treatment. You know, maybe be taking a walk and, and you know, finding leaves and making something out of it would be part of it. You see, the important thing is keeping, I call it, keeping the kid's brain connected to the world. That's the important thing. How do you recommend helping children in middle and high school deal with socialization when a lot of times they're the subject of bullying? Oh, teasing. Well, high school, I got kicked out of high school in ninth grade. I was in a large girls' school. And my weapon of choice was a book. I found something interesting. She, um, she called me a retard, and I beamed her with a really heavy book. <laughs> and I'd get angry and retaliate, teasing. And then somehow I switched from anger to crying. And I think that saved my career. Because I still had a lot of social problems in the meat plants, but I'd go hide under the stairs or in the electric room and cry, because if I'd thrown things and hit people, there wouldn't have been any, any um, career. Now, I did have friends, and where I had friends was with shared interests. There was no teasing riding horses or working in a science lab. You know, the teasing was more cafeteria and the, um, you know, places like that. And the kids interested in the special interests didn't, didn't do the teasing. Well, a big believer in, you know, get them in the art club, the drama club. Some of the verbal thinkers are good at being in plays. Uh, chess, computer club, Lego, Mindstorms, Robotics. Get them involved in things where they can do activities with shared interests. They also have to learn how to 
like maybe you get a team of two people to make the Lego robot. One does programming, the other does the mechanical engineering part of it. Because then they have to also learn to do an assigned task. The robot has to do some task that's assigned. But I have a lot of social problems. I have tons of social problems. Um, and teasing was absolutely terrible. And then in my book, The Way I See It, I talk a lot about that. Okay, right there. How not get what in school? Distracted. Distracted. Uh, well, you see, you know, when I was in elementary school, it was an old-fashioned classroom where everybody did this, their little arithmetic workbooks or worked on handwriting all at the same time. And it can sometimes be hard not to get distracted. Sometimes that's difficult. With later, later intervention, well, you see, the brain, there's some plasticity in the brain. Okay, you're born with a certain deck of cards you get served up with when you start. And the amount of problems in the brain can be variable. And, and uh, there's pretty, you know, let's say you take someone like me, real, you know, I was real severe when I was a little kid, but I had no seizures. It's the one thing they checked for. And, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't probably be here now if I hadn't gotten early intervention. Now you take someone that's a mild asperger, kind of geeky and nerdy. Uh, he might end up all right and end up working on the farm. A lot of these end up employed, but they're, they've got problems in their marital life. And then they find out they might be Asperger's, and reading all the books and things like that gives them a huge amount of insight. The other thing is, it's never too late to start. You know, you can always still sometimes get improvement. People tell me my talks at 60 are better than my talks at 50. <laughs> you see, you keep adding information to the database. That's why it's important to get them out doing things. They get out and do things, now there's more stuff in here for the Google in my mind, you know, to look at. You can always, you can always get improvement. You talked about the importance of learning to do something that other people need or want. Yeah. But that involves taking others' perspectives. Were you always able to take other perspectives? Okay, taking other people's perspectives. When I think about other people's perspectives, I think about it sort of visually, you know, on, uh, well, I remember one time I, I woke up mother to open a bottle of glue and she was not happy. <laughs> and one of the things I learned about that is the people don't like getting woken up, you know, so you want to be quiet around, <laughs> around another person when they're sleeping and you don't wake them up. You know, that's sort of the beginning, of it, but it's visual. You know, if I wrote a nasty letter to somebody, I'm now visualizing them opening it. I wouldn't like getting a nasty letter, because now it'd be a nasty text message. <laughs> but it's the, it's the same thing. But you see, I'd visualize it. Okay, they, they look at it on their phone and, you know, well, how would you feel if you got a nasty text message? You'd be pretty mad or upset about it. Well, another person probably is going to be mad or upset about it. You know, you don't care to hit other kids because you wouldn't like it to hit you. You don't, you don't, you share your toys. See, that's something that was taught to me very young, you know, the whole turn-taking thing. Also, a lot of games that were fun in the 50s you had to do with somebody else. Board games were real popular. That's how I learned turn-taking. A lot of fun things like playing table hockey. You had to do that with somebody else. You can't play table hockey with yourself. That was my favorite game. You got you to gotta do it with somebody else. But, you know, I had a, I had a lot of social problems. What are your thoughts on how communication now, especially for many young people, is now with the internet and emailing and Facebooking and less about face-to-face -face Well, you see, when I, was, uh, when I was real young, I would have loved all that e Facebooking and emailing because it was writing. You know, now, uh, when I first did my very first talk in graduate school, I panicked and walked out. And, and the thing that saved me in my cattle talks and made people have me come back and do cattle talks is I had great slides. I had, I had really good slides. And that's the thing that, you know, showing a whole lot of things from the cattle viewpoint. 
And the people thought it was weird, but boy, they liked my slides, and they were 35 millimeter slides, and I couldn't get a hold of them easily, like you could with the PowerPoint slides today. It, it's, um, but in terms of communication, because now it's less about you know, face to face or voice, you know, having. Um, well, I think they have a tendency to, a lot of them have a tendency to really want to, just, you know, really want to do that stuff. And the problem is, you know, still a lot of things that work for you need to be, uh, you know, communicating, you know, face to face. You know, and then there's some jobs, or somebody is a freelance animator or something like that, then, then, uh, you know, they can do the work freelance, but it's not very good, you know, for socialization. I'm a big believer in getting socialization through shared interests. Let's find some activities for them to do together where it's impossible to do it on Facebook or on texting where you've got to do it with somebody else. And you certainly don't want somebody on the spectrum spending six hours a day on texting and on the internet. You know, you've got to limit some of that stuff because otherwise that's all they're doing. Right here. Uh, you talked before about uh, living with fear um, and how people work in living with fear and one boy in mind comes to mind where he's just always saying, I hate this, I hate this. Do you hate this or you don't know anything about it? So how is it that we can... Well, you see, on the fear thing, some people on the spectrum are fearful all the time. You see, again, that's variable too. And then there's others where there's a lot less fear. Seems like us visual thinkers, we're the ones that really respond really well to a little bit of Prozac to kind of cut the fear back. I wouldn't be here now if I hadn't taken antidepressants in my early 30s. I was falling apart with stress-related health problems. I could barely move. You know, I was eating yogurt and jello all the time because of, you know, non-stop colitis attacks. It was just, you know, be, and then after I went on the medication, you don't have to eat yogurt and jello anymore. But again, there's a ton of inappropriate medications given out. Uh, uh, and, and, and too many different things. How do we replace or encourage the, the positive of the memory? Well, well, positive things, first of all, you know, a lot of exercise, and that also helps reduce the fear. Can't emphasize enough the importance of exercise. But get the kid doing things or activities he can do with other people that he enjoys, broaden those activities out. You know, shared activities and things like art and riding horses and building things. Those things just save me. If I hadn't had those activities, I mean, I would have, I wouldn't have gone anywhere. Can you talk about a sense of humor? Because when you were talking about epilepsy, it reminded me of my nephew. Will laugh when you call a joke, and I think, oh, he doesn't really. He's just moving and laughing. Well, humor is something that develops slowly. I had to develop that slowly, and I. You know, as I do more and more talks, I get better and better at, at those sort of things. See, the thing about being on the autism spectrum, it's almost like you never grow up. I didn't feel like a grown up until I was in my 40s. You know, it, it's, uh, and then when I was in my 40s, I'd get ID'd, you know, for age. And so I got gray hair. You know, there's, there's you know, and a lot of people, I don't know, it, it's, uh, I have to learn social rules like being in a play. And to me, some of the most fun things I've ever done, most funnest stuff I've ever done, was figuring out how to design stuff. They're figuring out how to do it. And you're sitting there brainstorming with somebody else. That's some of the most fun stuff I've ever done, where you're just trying to solve a problem. Well, I think that's, to me, that's really, really fun. The other thing that brain scan research showed is I was more interested in looking at pictures of things than at pictures of people. And one of the reasons why I was interested in looking at pictures of things is they had all these weird videotapes and I'm trying to figure out where they got the videotapes from. <laughs> but the problem is, if we didn't have people in this world that were interested in things, we wouldn't even have electric lights in this building. <laughs> Tesla, who invented the power plant, would probably be labeled autistic today. Mozart would probably be labeled autistic today or labeled with some other kind of disorder. You got rid of all the different disorders. You see, because you get these disorders in their milder forms, there may be advantages. In thinking in pictures, I got a quote in there from a, from a mental health researcher from the 40s. I think it was the 40s. 
And he said if you got rid of all the genetics that causes some of these disorders, you'd have dried up bureaucrats left. <laughs> Okay, right here. Uh, um, the other question I have is, I know earlier on in your life, you, um, you cope with your sensory problems with spinning, let's say, on a string and doing anything to get yourself out of yourself. But right now, I'm 31 years old, and I still rock back and forth. Well, there's a lot of people that are, that still do some of those sensory things. And uh, it's hard to tell other people when, like, I'm in a big place like this, Well, I wouldn't take medication just to stop rocking. I mean, some of the things that a legitimate uses for medication are extreme anxiety. If I hadn't gone on the antidepressants, I wouldn't be here. But let's say they loaded me up on Haldol, those are the old antipsychotics, well, then I'd be with the shakes and all kinds of, you know, terrible problems. You know, a lot of inappropriate, you know, medications are used. You can get some people to get extreme aggression problems. A little bit of Risperidol will stop that. Um, but it can have real bad side effects at the, at the higher doses. Somehow I switched from anger to crying. And the way that happened was after I got in a giant fist fight at my new boarding school, they took away horseback riding for two weeks. And somehow I switched. Now I was still miserable, but now I was crying rather than hitting. Well, they don't give medication now for crying, thank goodness. Because some kids I'm seeing get medicated up with so much junk they're turning into a zombie. Right. I mean, any medication, as soon as I find out it might cause memory problems or fog up your mind, goes to the bottom of my list. Right, you had mentioned Risperidol. I certainly take Risperidol, but I'm wondering how I... If... Well, some people do well on Risperidol, and if you're not gaining weight, and, and you're taking a reasonably low dose, you may be just fine. You see, the thing you've got to look at with medication is risk versus benefit. And Risperidol, of all the so-called atypical drugs, Risperidol was the first one. Prozac was the first SSRI. Risperidol was the first of the atypicals. And it's one of the best ones. And, and to take a, you want to take the lowest dose that will work. And then that reduces the side effects. And for some people, it works absolutely wonderful. But it shouldn't be given out like five-year-olds like candy. You have to look at, you, you see, one of the ways to determine, you try a medication, it all has a wow factor. Like, oh, wow, this really works. You don't take powerful drugs to make you teeny weeny bit less hyper. That wouldn't be a good enough reason to take a powerful drug. Now, when I went on the antidepressant, I'm actually on Norco on an old-fashioned tricycle. It was two days later, no more pounding heart, no more waking up in the middle of the night, sweating, my heart pounding. It was like, wow, this is magic. <laughs> Hi. Um a nine-year-old son with autism, and uh, as far as stimming goes, he does this thing where um, he's, he constantly has some form of a stick, whether it's a tennis racket or a lacrosse stick or a hockey stick or a bat, or, and he bangs it on the ground all the time. Is he verbal? Yes. He bangs his thing on the ground all the time? Yes. And uh, when the minute he wakes up, when the minute he goes to bed, he's, and, and when he's not doing it, he has a it's lying on the ground somewhere, and he has them lying all over the floor in our house. Um, and it's annoying. I mean, well, he's banging a stick on the ground all the time. Um, the, I, I wonder, see, they make, there's probably some sensory reason for that. Okay, what happens when you go into Walmart? How does he handle that? Uh, I don't go to Walmart. All right, how about, <laughs> all right, whatever. What happens when you go to the shopping mall? Okay, but how does he handle the shopping? Not bad. Not bad. How does he have any problem with fluorescent lighting? Uh, no. See, because some, you know, you know, he's banging a stick on the ground. You know, he's either wanting the proprioceptive stimulation from banging the stick, or maybe he just doesn't see very well, where the, everything in the environment's shaking. Because Tito Muckapadahe wrote a book called How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? And he can type independently, but he can only type one sentence before he has to flap and have a rest. 
and in his brain, shape, color, and motion circuits don't work together. Because if he sees a blue door, he sees a blue blob first, about the approximate size of a door, then he sees the outline. He doesn't see it all at once. And I've seen some kids on the spectrum tap everything in the environment. And they're doing it because they're trying to, it's like a blind person feeling with their cane to feel where they are. And, and, and uh, kids that have that problem, they're often better with all the auditory sense. So I know more people have questions, but Temple Grandin's trying to teach us regular time, not Sarah Lawrence time. So we're going to actually end. She's graciously offered to stay around. Oh, there's signs of books. She can sign your book. She can answer your questions. There will be a reception.